नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवद गीता एज इट इज चैप्टर 7 नॉलेज ऑफ द एब्सोल्यूट टेक्स्ट नंबर 1 श्री भगवान वाचाक्तिमरात्गण्यूम जन्मराश्रय असमशयाम समग्राम यथा गैसुसी थिनु श्री भगवान वाचाक्तमराश्रय असमशयाम समग्राम यथा गैसुसी थिनु श्री भगवान मयासक्तमनाथपर्तमशयामग्रमाग्यसुसीथिनु मयासक्तमनाथपर्त योगम्यूंजन्मनाश्रय असंशयाम समग्राम गायु तमे श्री भगवान वाच मयासक्तमनाथपर्तमुंजन्मराश्रय असंशयाम समग्राम यथा गैससी थिनु श्री भगवान वाच मयासक्तमनाथपर्त योगम्यूंजन्मराश्रय असंशयाम समग्राम यथाग्यु श्री भगवान वाच स्प्रीम लॉर्ड सैड माई टू मे असक्तमना माइंड अटैच पार्थ हौसन प्रता योग सेल्फ रिजेशन प्रैक्टिसिंग मत आश्रय in consciousness of me krishna consciousness asamshayam without doubt samagram completely mam me yatha how yes you see you can know tat that shrinu try to hear translation proposed by the divine grace ac bhaktivedant swami shri prabhupad supreme personality of god had said now here o son of prata how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me with mind attached to me you can know me in full free from doubt proposed in the 7th chapter of bhagavad gita the nature of krishna consciousness is fully described Krishna is full of all opulences, and how we manifest those opulences described here within. Also, four kinds of pious people, fortunate people, who become attached to Krishna, and four kinds of unfortunate people who never take to Krishna, described in this chapter. In the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the living entity is described as non-material spirit soul, capable of elevating himself to self-realization by different types of yoga. At the end of the sixth chapter, is clearly explained that the steady concentration of the mind upon Krishna, or in other words, Krishna consciousness, is the highest form of all yoga. By concentrating one's mind upon Krishna, one is able to know the absolute truth completely, 
but not otherwise. Impersonal Brahma Jyoti or localized Paramatma realization is not perfect knowledge of the Absolute because it is partial. Full and scientific knowledge is Krishna, <clears throat> and everything is revealed to the person in Krishna consciousness. In complete Krishna consciousness, one knows that Krishna is the ultimate knowledge beyond any doubts. Different types of yogis are only stepping stones on the path of Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> one who takes directly to Krishna consciousness automatically knows about Brahma Jyoti and Paramatma in full. By practice of Krishna Kajas Yogi, Yoga, one can know everything in full, namely the absolute truth, the living entities, their material their manifestations with paraphernalia, the material nature and their manifestations with paraphernalia. One should therefore begin yoga practice and explain the last verse of the sixth chapter. Concentration of the mind upon Krishna is made possible by prescribed devotional service in nine different forms, of which Shravanam is the first and most important. The Lord therefore said to Arjuna, touch Trinu, or hear from me. No one could be a greater authority than Krishna, and therefore by hearing from him, one, great, one obtains the greatest opportunity to become a perfectly Krishna conscious person. One has therefore to learn from Krishna directly, and not from a non-devotee upstart puffed up with academic education. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, the pro, this process of understanding Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Absolute Truth, is described in the second chapter of the first canto as follows. Srinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Shravanam Kirtana Vridhan Takstohi Abhijani Vidu Noti Saritsitam Nashta Prayeshva Bhadreshu Ityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki Tatara Dastamo Bhava Kama Lobhata Yasriye Chaitaitarna Vidam Sitam Satve Prasidati Evam prasanamana so bhagavat bhakti yoga taha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangasya jayate piti te riyate granti tasi chidinte sarva samashaya chidinte tasi karhuni drishte vatmanishvare. To hear about Krishna from the Vedic literature, to hear from him directly, is itself righteous activity. And when we hear about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend, and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing about him. This way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. The development of devotional service, one becomes free from the modes of ignorance and passion, and thus material lusts and average of Material lust and average, uh, uh, material lust and average should diminish. When these impurities are wiped away, one re- remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the signs of God perfectly. As Bhakti Yoga severs the heart not of material affection, enables one to come at once to the state of a samasham, samagramam, uh, understanding the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead. Therefore, only by hearing Krishna or from his devotee in Krishna consciousness, one understand the science of Krishna. So, the text again. Sri Bhagavan Vachamaya Sakhmanat Parata Yoga Myun Janman Ashaya Asam Shayam Samagramam Yatagya Sasita Shinu. Now, hear from me, O Son of Paritha, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. Namo Vishnu Vraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutta Shrimate Bhaktivedanta Swainta Namane Namaste Sarasutun Deve Gauravani Vicharane Nirvishesha Shunivani Paskatya De Satarane. As you probably know, Bhagavad Gita is divided into three different sections. First, as Prabhupada writes here, I think. The middle six, in the, the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, the living entities are described as non-material spirit soul capable of elevating himself to self-realization by different types of yoga. At the end of the sixth chapter, it's clearly explained that the steady concentration of the mind upon Krishna, or in other words, Krishna consciousness, 
is the highest form of all yoga. By concentrating one's mind upon Krishna, one can know the absolute truth in full, but not otherwise. So, this first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita is explaining how we're all spiritual beings and that we can become to the platform of self-realization through the gradual process of different kinds of yoga. Now, at the end of the sixth chapter, Krishna has explained that the whole aim of yoga is to concentrate the mind upon Krishna. And now Krishna will tell us, maya sakta manakparta. This asakta is this attachment to thinking about Krishna. It is possible beginning with tachinu, by hearing about Krishna. Hearing about Krishna is not different from associating with Krishna, but we may not understand that we're so much that we're associating with Krishna due to the fact that the, our association, as Krishna says, naham, prakasha, sarvasha, yoga maya, samarita, mudayam, nabhidananti, lokayam, ajam, avya. That I'm never re- revealed to the foolish and unintelligent, and for them I'm covered by my creative potency, yoga maya, and so the deluded world knows me not, who am unborn and inexhaustible. So if we don't know Krishna, we're also amongst the fools, the foolish people. But Krishna also says, Ukramantam Sitin Vapi, Bunjana Vagunam Vita, Vimurana Pashanti, Pashanti Jnana Chakshusha. The foolish cannot understand how the living entity quits his body or what kind of body he enjoys under the spell of the modes of nature. But those whose eyes are trained with knowledge can see all this clearly. So, even though we're fools, we can be trained. So we're not as foolish as the people who don't get trained. But we'd be foolish to think just because we're in the process of training, therefore we know everything. Because right now, we know, we know too many things, and they're all wrong. <laughs> so we have to stop thinking that we know so many things because that's what we're trying to do is get rid of all these things we think we know and find out what we should know how the living entity quits his body what kind of body enjoys under the spells and the modes of nature so we can be trained with knowledge now the seven the middle six chapters deal specifically specifically with pure devotional service and Krishna will reveal, as he does at the end of the at the end of the ninth chapter, Krishna will reveal the same thing as the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. Same thing as he's saying here. This is the introductory verse, but it says everything here. Tachinu, manmana. Hear about Krishna. But hear about Krishna with the idea: what is our objective? Manak parta asakta manak to have become attached to Krishna. And how do we become attached to Krishna? Well, ultimately, when one comes to the stage of a sakti, the happiness is so great, the love is so great, the pleasure is so great, the realization is so great that one cannot bear, bear to live without Krishna, just like a fish cannot bear living outside of water. Right, right now we're swimming in the ocean of material existence, and we think we're going to get some happiness here, and therefore we're attached to it, because we don't really know what real happiness is. And therefore we become attached to this happiness. We don't know that transcendental happiness is nanyam deho deha bhajam riloke kastan kaman arhate vidya bhujanye dupo divyam suputraka yena sadvam shudyat tasma brahma sokyam pranantam. It's brahma sokyam. The Brahma Sokyam is Ananta, is unlimited. And it goes on forever. Now, for instance, devotees were attracted to Prabhupada, not because he was an Indian old man, but because they saw that he was actually always in ecstasy. And sometimes devotees who had some credit, pious credit, and different circumstances they actually experience by his presence being in Vaikuntha. Of course, those memories can also be easily forgotten. 
And sometimes due to familiarity, as I noticed, sometimes I was on morning walks, sometimes due to familiarity, even the devotees who were supposed to be very close to Prabhupada were actually quite uh, familiar. And therefore their understanding of Prabhupada, his, where he was actually situated, diminished according to the familiarity. But in any case, Krishna periodically sends empowered devotees to give us an insight into the spiritual world so we can actually understand and take seriously to some extent what the words of Krishna are. Now, it would be very simple. We just read Bhagavad Gita and we remember it, but we're not on that platform. Therefore, we have to read it again and again. And hopefully we'll remember something as I repeat it again and again. And we're supposed to remember something. It's not just reading, but we should go over it again and again. At the end of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna Sanjaya says, uh, samsvida samsvida rupa madhya bhutam hare vishmaya ma me maharajan rishami cha punak punak. In the re- repeated remembrance, before that, he says that in the repeated tatcha samsrita samsrita, in the repeated remembrance of this conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, I'm taking pleasure, being thrilled at every moment, and remembering as well the wonderful form of Krishna. I become struck with wonder, and I rejoice it again and again. Now we may read Prabhupada's books and fall asleep. So that's all right. At least we get some good rest. (laughs) (laughs) But when we wake up, we should try to read again (laughs) and try to read in such a way as that something sticks. Something is in there. And what is the subject matter? Subject matter is only there's only two subject matters in Bhagavad Gita, by the way, the knowledge of the self and knowledge of the Supreme Self. That's it. Now, we're bored with knowledge of being eternal and blissful and full of awareness and that there's a person who has unlimited beauty and strength and knowledge and fame. And it sounds pretty boring to me. Rather read about the coronavirus or something. Then we miss the point. The point is not only the Bhagavad Gita tells us who we are, but it also tells us what we can do to realize it. And if we do something to realize who we are and who Krishna is, then it becomes exciting. Then it becomes adventurous. So, maya sattva manat parata yogam, and that's called yoga. Yunjan, marashrayaha, taking shelter of Krishna through following his instructions. Then it becomes a great adventure, something to be achieved by sacrifice. The discovery of ourselves, and of the Supreme Personality of Godhead it is not something to be taken lightly. There's, no, there's nothing in this world more valuable than that. Every other event in the material world, no matter what it is, will be met with the fact that it's always temporary. Even the great Roman emperor, pirate, uh, emperors, who went and conquered most of the known world at that time, when they come back to Rome with thousands of slaves and cartloads of jewels and gold and everything else. Defeated, so the defeated, the defeated soldiers would also come. They enter into Rome, and they'd be riding on their chariot, the emperor at the head, victorious, with unlimited wealth and sense gratification available now for him. And there'd be someone on his chariot whispering to his ear that you're only temporary. You're going to die. You're going to die. <laughs> So he wouldn't get too infatuated by the whole thing. And indeed, if you read the history of the Roman Empire, you'll find out most of the Roman emperors only lasted for a few years before they were either killed or there was a revolution or whatever happened. And they had to suffer the reaction for all their activities of illegally collecting all this wealth and conquering thinking that they become the emperor of the world. Even Mochukunda said that. He said, ultimately, I went around the whole universe because he was 
around the whole universe with my horses. I was, I was appointed by the demigods, by Karthikeya, to defend the demigods. How powerful he must have been. And on the earth planet, you go around the earth planet with the soldiers, the elephants, the horses, and the chariots, and he conquer the whole earth, which was probably been Bhumandala at that time. Plexi dweep, Samanta dweep, and all these other dweeps. Huge area. Then he come back, and at the end of the time, what was, his, what was the result? That he go into the apartments of his queens, and he had to fall there, down at their feet to get a little sense gratification. That was the culmination of the whole thing. So although he was a whole emperor of the whole world, of the universe, practically, he was conquered. But ultimately, he had to fall down at the feet of his queens for a little sense gratification. So that's material existence. Luckily, Muchakunda happened to be in a cave sleeping for a long time, probably hundreds, if not thousands of years, because he was quite tired. Conquer the, to fight against all the demons in the universe, conquer them, and then conquer the whole planet. It takes a lot of effort. You get tired after a while. So he was sleeping, he got the benediction to sleep. But luckily, Krishna utilized him to kill Kalyavana, burn him to ashes, because he had got the benediction from Kartikeya that whoever woke him up from his sleep would be burned to ashes. So Mujakunda was chasing, uh, Kalyavana was chasing after Krishna to fight with him. Krishna went into the cave. Kalyavana thought that this man who was sleeping there was Krishna. He went up to him and kicked him, woke him up. And woke him up, uh, Mujakunda opened his eyes and Kalyavana burned it into ashes. Be careful who you wake up. <laughs> who knows what benedictions they might have. And then he saw Krishna, and then he understood, because he had heard from Gargamuni in the 25th millennium or something, I can't remember, 25th or 27th millennium, that Krishna would appear, and therefore he became a little Krishna conscious by seeing Krishna, and he understood what actually life was meant for. Now, we ourselves probably are not going to sleep in a cave, hopefully. Well, for right now. And if someone woke us up, we definitely wouldn't burn them to ashes. And it's very unlikely Krishna is going to enter into the cave. But we have the opportunity to hear about Krishna now, to hear about him, and to practice Krishna consciousness. Of course, to the practice Krishna consciousness means do those things that will actually help awaken our Krishna consciousness. That's all. We don't have to do a million things. We don't even have to save the whole world. We just have to do the things that will actually help us remember Krishna. And if we do that and become Krishna conscious and are able to save ourselves, then Krishna, Shakti, Vinanaya, Tara, Pravartana. Then we might be able to do something to help someone else. Or as Prabhupada said, we go out and distribute books and then we say, please take this book and give a donation. And then they say, well, what's in the book? And we go, I don't know. They never told me to, to read the books. They told me to distribute them. So you please, you go and read the book. Come back tomorrow, I'll be here, and you can tell me what's in the book. <laughs> I don't have time to find out what's in the book. <laughs> so we should find it out what's in the book. And then when we look around, we should see the book. If we don't see what's in the book, then what are we seeing? We're just seeing our imagination. Not our imagination. We're seeing the gift that the illusory energy has given us called imagination. We're seeing through our eyes of imagination. And, and therefore, we're going to act in an imaginary, deluded way. And the result is we just become more intoxicated by the illusory energy. And then, of course, we come to the temple, we chant a little bit, and we go... What happened? <laughs> Where was I? And then we go back again in the trance of Maya, <laughs> looking around, what's going on? <laughs> what was that Christian consciousness? Oh, <laughs> come back to the temple. Oh my God, I was asleep. <laughs> Let's go. So we have to learn how to take Christian consciousness out of, the, out of the temple, into our lives. So wherever we're looking, we can understand how everyone and everything is related to Krishna and then relate to them accordingly. 
relate to them as Krishna would like us to. And then develop the skill of that. It's not, even we, try, we remember, then we get puffed up. I'm so advanced, I can't believe it. I actually remember a verse from Bhagavad Gita. I'm definitely going back to Godhead. You know. What time is the chariot coming? I don't, I don't want to be late. No, Maya will always say, yeah, you're so great. I can't believe it. Even I become your devotee. <laughs> So as soon as we get a little advanced, the Maya will, will try to bewilder us. We go, yes, yes. Go, tell me more, Maya. I love you. <laughs> You're so, you, you appreciate my service to Krishna more than anyone does. <laughs> no one realizes how nice a devotee I am. Even Krishna doesn't realize. <laughs> but you do. So we should be learn how to see, and then develop some skill so that as we become more expert servants, then we also should become more humble at the same time. But not only humble, but we should also develop more and more transcendental discrimination and expertise in our service. So the result is that we gradually, Krishna can have be confident in us that he's not gonna empower us and we're gonna misuse the power because he's empowered so many people and they've misused it. And the result is they've had a difficulty in devotional service. The more we get empowered, then the more Maya will try to de delude us and say, wow, you're so powerful, I love you. you know. So Krishna is very careful how much he's gonna empower us so we, we don't go off the track and then fall somewhere and, and, and find it difficult to get up again. Because Krishna will do that. He'll get one immense power, immense fame, well, comparatively. Prabhupada said, in the absence of a big tree, then a castor bush looks quite big. You know what castor bush is? It's a little tiny bush. I don't know how big it is. I don't know what a castor bush is either, but do you know what a castor bush looks like? Anyhow, it's smaller than a tree. <laughs> But in the absence of a, of a big tree, then a little cat, a bush appears to be big. So in the absence of the actual standard, then we may imagine ourselves or others to be on some kind of exalted level because we don't really understand what the actual standard is. The real standard is that which our minds, I mean, just the most minimum standard is here at the beginning, touch chinu, maya sapta. He's only, Krishna's only talking about asakta. That's, that's still within the asakti, at least that stage, is still within the realm of sadhana bhakti. Still the mind sometimes wanders, rarely, but it wanders away from Krishna. Now, if we're a little conscious during the day, we should think, has my mind wandered away from Krishna at all? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Generally, we're so unconscious, we don't even know when, when we, our mind wanders to Krishna, we think we've become a pure devotee. Somehow or another, when it wanders. And the rest of the day, we, we're unco practically unconscious. So we have to gradually, step by step, Krishna says, it's not gonna be an immediate process. It says step by step with full conviction. One should become situated in trance by means of intelligence, sustained by, with, with full conviction, and that's the mind should think of the self alone and nothing else. So we're trying to sit here and hear this philosophy. Why are we doing it? To develop some intelligence, some vision, some understanding what to do, why to do it, how to do it. So that the conviction will be there, intelligence. And then what's the idea? We can develop determination. And what is that determination? When we're not attracted by sense gratification, when we realize our lesson that yes, every time I look at the objects of the senses, the idea of developing attraction, for, I become attracted by them, then lust comes, then greed, then anger, then delusion, then bewilderment memory, and I lose my intelligence and my determination because I'm in a fog. So I have to stop contemplating the objects of the senses and start becoming determined 
to get free from material, to become a little from material desires and fix the mind upon Krishna. Then one can actually experience gradually Krishna consciousness. One can understand what is Krishna consciousness and how to, how to perform activities in Krishna consciousness, why to perform activities in Krishna consciousness, how to perform activities in Krishna consciousness with the conviction and the skill of doing so. Then one can actually become conscious of Krishna gradually. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I think you have explained the steps, but maybe <clears throat> I can uh, ask um, a question about plateauing in our uh, Krishna con uh, reaching a plateau. You know, like uh, we. Uh, meet devotees and for some time we are joyful, ecstatic, and then uh, we reach sort of a plateau, kind of a desert of Anartha Nivriti, hopefully, or something, and it seems it's limitless. And uh, sometimes it becomes very dry, <clears throat> even though the person knows most of the things that they should know. So, uh, what is the is there a way to avoid avoid these plateaus and uh, and what to do when one reaches that plateau? Well, everyone needs a challenge. Generally speaking, we get to a, there are different levels of plateaus, but one of them is Tarangi Rangini, the uh, small ways of devotional service. Oh, there are many others too. But the general principle is that if we have a goal in mind and then we, by devotional service, we achieve it, for some time we become complacent. And because of that complacency, we kind of like skim along. We could even do it for a lifetime or two <laughs> until we become attracted to the objects of the senses again because we get bored and then we get smashed. We come crawling back to Krishna, please, I was foolish, I was puffed up, I was complacent, I was this and that. And then we get the opportunity to make some progress again. So that may go on after, uh, during some lifetimes, it might go on for five minutes, depending on our level of advancement. But that's how Maya works. We have some desire, whether it's to get free from distress or some comfort or inquisitiveness or getting free from all problems of life, becoming self-satisfied. So we have these desires and we work and we work and we struggle and we struggle and we get to it and we think, ah, oh, I need a break. And Maya says, yes, I agree, you need a break. And then we go on for some time and finally Maya says, I think it's time for me to break you. <laughs> you definitely need a break. <laughs> <laughs> and then Maya breaks us and we're, we're, we feel help, hopeless, helpless, and whatever. And we start going back to Krishna, taking shelter of him again. So that goes on. We take maybe over lifetimes, it may be over years, it may be over weeks, it may be over minutes, it may be over seconds. It depends on where we're, where we're at at the process. But we can expect it, that's all. And the more knowledge we get, then the, the more we'll not be so inclined to go along with Maya. Yes. Often the person knows that they should aspire uh, for some next higher station or uh, level, and they know what this level is, uh, theoretically, but they, they know they should, but they wouldn't rather do it. They don't have the actual inspiration, motivation to, to do it. Um, what then can be done? Well, I think right now we're in a situation, ISKCON, for instance, where, and the world itself, that we don't have the full manifestation of our society. And therefore, it's, our society itself, as a movement, is not moving very much. And therefore, people, the members of the movement don't move because they don't, they look around, 
especially in the Western world. If you go to places like India where there's a lot of movement going on, or Russia or the Ukraine or whatever, there's a lot of movement going on. Therefore, it seems like the devotee is more inspired up to a level. They, they, you know, they go out, but they don't necessarily have the full vision either of what the whole thing, you know, how to achieve devotional service. And they're going, but they're going along with the momentum. And that momentum is spiritual. And therefore, they're enthusiastic to some extent, and they're, you know, learning things and going on. And in the Western world, it seems like, you know, we're, we're isolated and we're, you know, people don't think that we're a cult. They don't even think about us anymore. And, they, you know, they think, well, if there's a cult, it's a pretty harmless cult. I don't do anything. And just go and sing on the street, you know. So that's pretty good. We need some entertainment. So we don't have that full manifestation as we used to. And, and when the full manifestation is there, even people who are complacent, they can't stay around in such an environment. It's just like they feel out of place. They feel, feel uncomfortable. And therefore, you know, they don't stay. They just go where they, where they actually feel more comfortable. So that has to come. Otherwise, to be complacent and, you know, go along is, is normal now. Everyone feels comfortable. But when the, if the movement or when the movement develops, then we won't, we'll know I have to get out of my comfort zone if I'm going to stay in it. That may take, but it may take a little time, but not too much time. We don't have that much time. Anything else? Thank you very much. Grantaraj Bhagavad Gita Kijai. Shila Prabhupada Kijai. Kaur Primanande. Thank you.